Um, I understand that some of you just joined after lunch, and it's a five and a half days work week here. So I appreciate that why you couldn't make it this morning. And what we have done today is um, I started up myself um, a couple of uh, sessions and then followed through with our university company, our own rent up venture stuff, gone through some of the presentation. So what I would like to do is perhaps if some of you are interested that didn't attend this morning session, I'm happy to actually go through at least one of the presentation that I did this morning because I mean the title itself talk about how do you develop a new technology venture. Um, so I'm happy to sort of go through the next 20 minutes, 30 minutes, uh, sort of rerun that session for some of you that have not, uh, were not here. But for the, the rest of you that were here, I wouldn't, um, uh, I wouldn't let you go through the agony of uh, sitting through another presentation. Perhaps there will be some networking outside uh, for some of you who already gone through the session. So would some of you like to actually hear out that first session that I did? Um, nobody seems to make any moves. <laughs> So let me uh, just walk through it anyway. Uh, so, so um, if you felt um, that um, you have heard that session, you want to move on, it's fine. Uh, and uh, if you want to stay back, otherwise, I think the seminar today ended, and tomorrow, what time we will start? Nine thirty. Yeah. So nine thirty tomorrow there are two workshops. Some of you have registered for the program. Uh, I assume it's the same location. So, so my my first session was you can learn to be a technopreneur. Um, so what I'm going I'm going through on the session. I'm going to go through in a sort of a faster faster pace. Essentially, question that I would try to answer in my presentation is that is technopreneurship for you? Secondly, share a little bit of my journey uh, as a technopreneur, how I learned to become a technopreneur. Thirdly, perhaps share some of the attribute of what constitutes a successful technopreneur. Then we have a program that we put together and will be launching in Myanmar. It's actually a learning pathway to become a technopreneur. So we'll share some of the detail. I mean, we all know that the world has changed a lot and it has changed to the extent that a lot of this new technology changed the way we work, the way we play, the way we live and certainly uh, even in terms of how businesses is built in many of the country, it has changed. The traditional businesses which include like, properties, uh, setting up a restaurant, obviously those business will continue to stay but many of the services business in Singapore for example have moved into IP oriented, innovation oriented businesses. So every country stated that they want to be the Silicon hub of the world and this movement has been going on in many many countries. Singapore is a good example for many years now, the government has been extremely supportive in terms of putting up an ecosystem that will be able to help start up, get started, help them to scale their business, grow their business. And I believe that there are great opportunity in Myanmar uh, in terms of such new generation businesses, given the Economy is going to leapfrog quickly, uh, leveraging on the new technology they're servicing. So we believe that there will be a lot of opportunity how new, innovative, disruptive business model could be introduced using new technology that hopefully could help uh, propel the economy forward much more faster than it would have been. So I'm not going to go through so much. Many of you, I'm sure, recognize those faces, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, and many of them have built great companies that have changed the way we live. And even in Singapore, there have been quite a few of many successful entrepreneurs. 
And this entrepreneur, uh, not necessarily just from the IT sector, it could be anything from creating uh, new waters. Uh, in fact, in Singapore, actually, uh, given that there's not enough water in the country, they have actually uh, developed what they call new water. Actually, the new water is actually recycled from toilet water. So, so that's innovation, and Singapore now is actually self-sufficient on uh, water. And in a startup is never short of excitement. In fact, if you are in a startup, what you learn can be three times, four times more than what you would learn in a more structured corporate environment. And a lot of time, being in the startup is not just about money, it's about excitement, it's about uh, doing meaningful things. You hear from many of the speakers that a lot of what this startup is doing are actually about changing the world. So, a lot of the time, life is short. If you can be part of the opportunity to change the world and it add meanings uh, to, to what you are doing. So, so we always feel that uh, working in the startup is always a good start uh, in your career. Um, as a technopreneur, there are many opportunities. Obviously, the core of that is that becoming a senior, serial and technopreneur. And frequently, um, these days, it's not like the entrepreneur of the old day that for you, you, you do one business for your whole life. But serial entrepreneur today, particularly technopreneur, in fact, every three, five, or seven years, they actually do one business and they'll continue to do that. And in the US, particularly a more mature market of this nature, you hear entrepreneur that build multiple businesses one after another. You call them serial entrepreneur. And even a large corporate might actually have a certain department. They might also need this sort of skill set because the person who are entrepreneur are very different from a person from a corporate. I'll share with you what, are, what those attributes are. And management in startup and SME uh, also need this type of skill set that the technopreneur is having. So in part of Having the ability to become a technopreneur, we believe that it opened up a lot of pathway growth opportunity, either it be building your own business or working in a larger company. So personally, um, I started my business, in fact, almost immediately after I graduated with $5,000 from my grandmother at the age of 23. And, and I built a banking software company that had been sold to about 40 countries in 100 banks and I had 500 people working in my off in my company which has 10 offices around the world. So the company got listed in 2005 and I sold the business to SunGuard. Uh, it's actually one of the largest financial services software in the world in 2006 for 120 million dollars. Up to today, it's still one of the largest uh, exit in Singapore in history in terms of the size of the company but sold for software company. So, so the experience really is that in general, uh, building that company over a long period of time, there are a few very important uh, strategy elements. First, you have to have the right product for the right market, and that's very, very important. If you start that wrong, you're probably not going to be successful, because if you have the wrong product for the, for the, for the wrong market, uh, even uh, your ability to execute is strong, but you still would not be able to challenge uh, having the uphill task to, to execute. So for my company, we didn't start just straight away into the banking sector. We try many times for different sectors, to certain sectors such as even a, work sh a watch shop, um, uh, trading company. So until we find the right market, then we kept our focus. The right market to us for many years has been banking product, uh, banking software product for the world. And people as well, actually when you grow a business over 10, 20 years, uh, the company size change. Like my company went from a one man to 50, to 150, to 500. So when the company size changes, your leadership ability required would be different. It's very different when you run a 10 people company versus a 200 people company versus a 500 people company. 
So you have to have the right leadership skill. I was lucky to be able to reinvent myself, to be able to manage the different sizes of company. Not everybody has managed to do that. And also at different time of the development of the company, you actually need different team of people. Some people are better working in the smaller company, some people are better working in the bigger company. And having the right people at the right time is absolutely critical. For a technology venture, it's absolutely important that businesses receive sufficient funding to grow. It's a type of business that a lot of the time, different from traditional business, that external capital is very important. I talk about Instagram. Although they were bought for a billion dollars, but they had a hundred million dollars of investment. And even the hundred million dollars, even after they were sold for a billion, uh, they never actually have any revenue. So funding is critical. So, so for the tech venture, therefore, the way it's built is going to be different from the way a traditional business is built. A traditional business, you tend to go in, make money, use the money that you make to generate, to grow the business. Whereas uh, for a tech company, let's say you start up a job portal in Myanmar, you can't possibly try to make money before you expand. You probably have to get ready enough money, money for a couple of years and really build the market share, the, the, the customer size, and slowly trying to inch toward uh, break-even point. Chances is that before you break even, you probably um, um, run out of money. So what is important is that as an investor, we look at what they can achieve, let's say, in a couple of years. So then by end of two years, if they achieve those customer base, let's say, I have a hundred thousand, let's say I have a, a one thousand corporate hiring through my job portal. That would be enough to entice the next investor to put in more money to support the company. So funding has to be the right funding at the right time. You don't want to actually do it too early. So in order to have to be an entrepreneur that understand how to put together the right strategy is very important that they have certain insight. And in fact, to build a successful strategy uh, business, although 10% strategy is only needed, 90% is execution, but if you get the 10% wrong, you would not actually be able to grow the business, even though you have very strong execution ability. So what, what this like trying to, to say is that that strategy is as important of ex and as execution, but execution is even more important, but you can't do without the right strategy. So therefore, as an entrepreneur, how you are able to fulfill that needs to have the right strategy and the right execution would be key. So, so what, is the what is the attribute of a successful entrepreneur? I believe character and personality is important because without the right character and personality, you can't actually inspire follower. As a small company, as a company with high risk, as a company that you need to do a lot more for less resources that you have, you have to have the personality that provide visions to allow people to follow you. So there are some attributes behind that. The question always is, can you learn the characters and black personality? Not everything, but if you work in a startup environment long enough, it would actually shape your character and personality. This is most important in terms of execution. Execution is about going out there and knowing your strategy, execute, develop the product, market the product, sell it, manage the business. So you have to have a very broad range of uh, capability that would touch on the development of every organization. So your skill cannot be limited to just technical capabilities such as software development. If you are just a good software developer, chances is that you would not be a good technopreneur. You could have a foundation as technology, technical personnel, but you have to start learning other aspects in terms of sales, in terms of marketing, in terms of business management particularly. 
this is important because when I talk about strategy, is to be able to see forward and to be able to decide what is the right thing to do at the right time for the company, the right product and the right market that you need to go after. So to do that generally, when you have more experience, you have better ability to, to establish the right insight. So I call that wisdom. When you get older, you are getting better and on it. But having said that, you can have older people that doesn't necessarily have the wisdom to actually put the right strategy for high tech startup. So, but I think it can be learned. It can actually be learned. So I'm going to share with you how you can learn, acquire the wisdom in a very short period of time so that you can use that to put up the right strategy for your business. So, so what I've talked about is that uh, you also need network. You know, it's like doing every business. I mean, your parent would have started up a business. It wasn't just about his skill. He has the network to be able to start his business. So you also need to, to build some network to be able to become a successful entrepreneur. So this forum, as an example, is a very good opportunity not just to get insight in terms of how different businesses work, Therefore, you can use that for your strategy, but also you can gain that network that I think will be very important. The network is, do you know investor that would potentially would invest in you? Do you have potential partner that would be able to work with you to build a business? Or do you have customer that would be able to give you that first chance? So that network is important. So what we're trying to do, in fact, our learning pathway is to try to provide those capabilities so that you can learn and prepare to be a successful entrepreneur. So my last part of the presentation is therefore how do you learn? What is the approach on which you learn to become an entrepreneur with those attributes that I talk about? So entrepreneurship is hard, it's not easy, it's exciting, but the question always is can this be learned? I'm a very good example of actually an entrepreneur that actually started very young. Nobody taught me how to build a businesses, but I actually managed to build it to a very large company because I learned how to do it along the way. But again, I think there are shorter ways in, in which you can learn to do that. I've gone through a 20 years period learning it the hard way, make many, many mistakes. So what I hope to do is to come up with a program that you can gain those capability, competency, character, insights, network in a much shorter period of time uh, so that uh, you don't have to go through what I'm doing. So this is a one page snapshot of what I think you need to have to be a successful entrepreneur. I'm sure that you probably don't have all of them. It's not supposed to be. But these are things that you, you have to start building. Uh, the first thing is really character and personality. Just these are just some of the attribute EQ, AQ. EQ is about how good are you with people? Because you need to deal with your people, your employee, your customer, your investor, your EQ is important. AQ is about as a startup, you are as a small kid uh, out of the block, and really every day you will get rejected. And many, many times you get rejected, you get beaten down. Somebody treat you a little bit like a dirt because you are so small. And you try to sell something that would never install somewhere else. You are going to get uh, put down. But your ability to stand back up again is very important. So uh, we call it AQ. Passion is very fundamental. You must enjoy what you are doing. Just now, let's say we talk about game, I want to build a game company. You must have a passion for game. If you are not a gamer, probably you, you never is going to be good at it. Uh, I think you also need to continue to learn. In fact, even at this age, I enjoy learning. I continue to like to learn. I ask questions because that's the only way that you can actually gain that type of skill. And for, for a technopreneur, you really need to know a lot in order to build a good business. You need to be trusted. I think people somehow be yourself and if you can't be trusted you probably can't have follower and i think always there will be risk uh, no risk no gain and this is something that really is this entrepreneur if you don't have it don't do it 
multidisciplinary skill and competency, as I said, sales, marketing, product development, delivery, business, and financial management. You need to know them all. So the training that we did is supposed to allow you to have the chance to give you a structured training as well as a chance to practice. So I also talk about the, the insight in the network. So how do we structure a program? The first thing is that there are so much to learn. So the way that we actually try and structure the program is if anything that you learn in our program, if you can't use it today or tomorrow, we are not going to teach you. If anything that you read, you teach, is not going to allow you, give you the step of doing A, 1, 2, 3, 4, following the step, chances is that it's going to be very difficult for you to use that tool to actually do that. So a lot of our teaching, some of you actually never, didn't have a chance to hear one of the sessions by Charlie, is that we really focus on methodology, internationally proven methodology, framework and best practices. Uh, for those that wasn't here, Charlie was talking about Lean Startup, Lean Canvas. These are internationally accepted methodology that has been used globally by many of the very successful US-based international startups to build their product, to articulate their business model. And you are actually going through that. So some of you that you were here, you would probably see the presentation that Charlie always talk about step one, two, three, four, what do you need to do? So given that methodology, when you encounter that situation, you sh shouldn't have to try to figure out how to actually go about doing it because we have given you the step. I also share with you, in fact, uh, one of our slides uh, to do that. And secondly, I think the learning need to be experiential. Entrepreneurship, technopreneurship is not something that you can learn from the classroom. It's really, it needs to be learned in an experiential manner. So how, what we do is we incorporate what we call a capstone module, which is a module that you work on real life project. And you actually take everything that you learn, you create a, a business plan, and the end of that business plan, in fact, you present to investors in Singapore, actually. You go to Singapore, you present to them, you might get funding, you might not, but certainly they will share with you why your, your business plan work, why it doesn't work. But the important thing is for six months, you'll be working on the real life business plan. And we also have regular experience sharing session by entrepreneur, by uh, startup founder that you have heard. Um, and we do this regularly, even in the class. This to us is very important. Sometimes it's even more important than what you learn from the classroom because you never know what the more you hear, and today you hear about six or seven, we think going through a program of six months, you might hear 50 of them throughout the program. So if you hear so many, you are going to have a data bank that know how the different business business is built. And we even share with you why some of the businesses fail, because they, the way they have done it. So only going through this, you have all the knowledge to basically come up with a strategy for your business that have a better chances of success. And we also look at, given that many of the people might be working professional, you, so we have structured a program to allow people to attend without this, on a part-time basis. So we use social media platform so that we can facilitate peer-to-peer -peer learning. So if you have a particular uh, project, we put it on the social media network and everybody can actually go through it and even the question you ask us about certain question about your business plan, we would actually lock in those answers so that you can actually learn and understand all your... Because inside the room there could be 50 people and this, this data bank is not just in Myanmar. Myanmar we have a class, in Singapore we have a, actually a very big class, like we have 200 students a year. So. All those material is on the social media, you can actually go through it. So you could go through a hundred case study, they are all real life case study, so that you actually get the insight. So the insight will help you when you build your business. Because whatever you are doing, somebody probably have done it in some way. Maybe some of them done it. Actually when somebody said, this is what I want to do, there's no guarantee that it's correct or wrong. Only after you do it, Maybe it's a combination of factors that it failed or it, it, it's 
succeed. So it's by it's by actually seeing how other people do it that help you to gather the inside the data bank in your brain, so that you can actually say, for my business, this is appropriate for me. So the ten percent strategy. I'm not saying that you get the right strategy, but at least you you make sure that you have the ability to put together almost the right strategy, and then the rest of the execution. Um, uh, the important thing is really about experiential learning is applying what you learn. So this is a module that we talk about. Um, so I'm going to quickly just go through them. But essentially, if you look at them, they are really combination of module that help you to develop a new product. After you develop a new product, how do you go to market? After you go to market from a marketing standpoint, how do you sell? After that, how do you manage your business? Um, then there's also a module called Technology Venture Case Study, which we put together 10 companies in detail. Today, we can't actually put their detail. Like for example, Pirate 3D would be actually one of the companies that would be a case study. We would go into detail how they actually uh, raise money from Kickstarter, because that's a good example of, based on this, you actually know how to go and raise money from the Kickstarter, like what they do. So I'm not going to go through too much detail. So Charlie actually spoke about this in one of the sessions. Essentially, this is a lean canvas, it's a methodology. So it actually teaches you how to uh, go through uh, various phases, answer the right question, go through the step, therefore creating uh, a product strategy, a strategy, a business strategy. And I talk about the marketing framework. I mean, it sounds simple. I have a product I want to take to market. If you look at the number of steps that you have to take, and the sub item that you need to do, like for example, uh, if you talk about about a customer segment, you actually need to define what is a buyer persona. How does the buy the buyer look like? And you have to take from marketing standpoint, from analysis, all the way to uh, sales. So there's a framework again. This framework is actually. Uh, a very popular framework that the largest technology company in the world have been using it called Pragmatic Marketing Framework. So we are delivering that. Um, beyond actually direct sales, you also can leverage on social media marketing. Again, Julian Lowe has spoke about the various ways in terms that you can sell it in the social media world. And even sales, it sounds simple. You take a product, you go to ask somebody if they want to buy the product, if you look at this chart, we even have a method in which how you sell. You need to do a lot of preparation before you even talk to the customer, whether they want to buy or not. Even after they want to buy, you have a lot of preparation after the meeting to make sure that you follow through. So, in fact, the person who crafts this program is actually an insurance salesperson. It's very difficult. If you can sell an insurance, you can probably sell anything. So we also look at technology venture management. How do you manage your business? How do you put together sales and marketing processes, management reporting? How do you establish to use tool to manage your, your pipeline? What is your management structure like? And these programs specifically look at the management capability to manage startup, small company. Uh, a management approach for small company is very different from very large company. So this is Taylor. In fact, we have a whole booklet. This is a type of report. This is a thing that you do. This is what you do every week on the sales and marketing meeting. That's what you do every month. These are the way that you define your KPI. So it's all thought inside the program. The real life case study is important. As I said, sharing insight is important. And so the program essentially, we're trying to keep it quite short, six month duration. And in fact, it's done on a part time basis. What we do is once a month, we have a flying faculty coming in from Singapore and we we'll run a four days program compact, perhaps from Monday to, to, uh, to sorry, to, from Friday to Monday, you might have to take a couple of days off every month. And then before and after the uh, flying faculty, we would have online, we have tutor on site locally, we send from Singapore that help you to prepare uh, for the session. We also use social media to learn. We also have a visit that we take all the students to Singapore, meet up with a Singapore company. The objective is to learn from the experience deeper, but it's also uh, important that we 
we ensure that the opportunity for them to collaborate or partner. Like for example, a lot of our startup walking up here, one of the objectives they're coming here is to look at potentially how to collaborate with you. And collaboration not just in terms of partnership, but also can be in terms of you working for the company. And many of the company want to set up either a development center or they want a partner to work with to address the local market. So therefore, using a program like that, we will be able to provide the type of network, the type of insight, and the type of skills that you need, uh, preparing you, hopefully, to become an entrepreneur. So I hope that uh, in a short time, uh, moving quite quickly, I have been able to articulate, uh, provide you at least a, a general view that number one, is technopreneurship for you? Is it something that you want to persuade as a career path? I just want to emphasize that it doesn't mean that you have to start the business, but what is important is that it gives you certain skill that could work in even larger company. Secondly, is understand those attributes so that you can work toward uh, developing your capability to have the attribute of and becoming a successful technopreneur. And then clearly articulate the type of program that we have to provide you a potential learning pathway to learn to be a, a technopreneur. Thank you. Do you have any question? Perhaps uh, I didn't take any question just now. I'll be happy to take some question. Okay. So anyway, yes, please. So for for let's say anybody interested to to attend the, the program. Yes. Um, can you give a little bit brief about the cost, uh, the cost of uh, the, the, the fees, okay. and also the time that would need for somebody to invest? What are the pre-qualifications that would need okay. to actually be successful in this program? Okay. Maybe I cover part of it, and theory can help me with that. The first thing is that we felt that teaching this program, the important part is that the person who teach it is very critical. We wanted a program to teach to, to experienced technopreneur and practitioner who have been practicing. We don't want any academic people to come and teach that. That's why the people who teach that, either they are entrepreneur themselves or they are venture investor, and we have to bring them from Singapore. At the moment, I think it's too early. And also, I think the student want to hear from an international uh, uh, individual who have internationalization experience to come in. So from a time standpoint, essentially it's a four to four and a half full day type of program. So like let's say we start from Friday, so it's almost at nine to six o'clock for four full days until uh, Monday. So for some of the working professional, they might probably have to take a few days off. Uh, once a month, two days, I think it's fine. Then we also have on-site tutor and facilitator that we make ourselves available at night because after your work, there will be a couple of nights perhaps that we put aside to prepare you for the flying faculty coming in on the weekend or after they come in, you need more clarification. So that's the second part. So, so you might have to spend a day or maybe a, a one night a week in, uh, in this uh, night to prepare. And then the rest is actually a lot. We're also trying to use social media platform. Let's say you have some answer that you need to ask. You could actually use a social media platform to ask that question, and that question and answer will be made available to everybody in the class. So everybody get to, and all the material, everything will be in the social media platform that we put together. So, so in terms of timing, so if you are working, it doesn't stop you from doing it provided you can actually take a couple of days off a month and that would be for six months so the first month the first five months would be in Myang, in Yangon the, the six will be visiting Singapore that's probably about a five days thing um, so so that is the um, the part in terms of prerequisite we thought we believe that there will be different people that might be interested in fact, one group would be working professional. You are already IT professional. Maybe you want to gain this additional skill so that you can move up to be management or you want to start your own business. So, so these are working professional. So if they are working professional, 
English, I think, is, is obviously important. So we we'll look at some minimum uh, English uh, level, uh, which is similar to when you have to take an international uh, master or, or international bachelor program. That's 6.5. Yeah, that's 6.5. Uh, in terms of and those fresh graduate, it's also similar requirement. They might not have come to work before. Uh, they can actually follow through. So there will be exception if, because we are also thinking this is something we are in preparation. Some of the module would get accredited into, into some master program from some foreign university, which we are, we are still working on that. So, so that's essentially the piece. I think theory, maybe you want to talk a little bit about the... Fee structure for yeah, the yeah. Myanmar, we would all like to tell you about this course. It's a course around about 9,000 9, USD for the first person. It's just like the we are delivering in Myanmar. Yes, the USD $9,000 for the whole entire this uh, diploma, professional diploma course. Yeah. Hope I have answered in clarity the question. Just curious, what are the times of 42 hours? Okay. So if you think, actually it's much more than 42 now because the 8 hours a session uh, for 4 days at 4, 8, 32 but actually what we have also, we have tutoring uh, come in that actually combine that so those are the learning hours, classroom hours outside we actually don't include it and the capstone project is much uh, bigger because capstone is uh, it's almost like a thesis that you do in a master degree you actually don't go to the class and it's more about a supervisor that supervises you on the project. So what we do is that you find your own company that you can work with to actually come up with a real life project. We also might put some company in front of you. But what we hope you would do is to actually come up with some idea and then we will actually walk you through that idea. The important thing is our facilitator will make sure that your business plan and your presentation on your business, hopefully at least in the structure, we can't guarantee because idea is yours, that it actually meet the needs of international investor, high tech investor, because we look at certain things. And that certain thing, we want to make sure we advise you to incorporate into your proposal. In fact, my next presentation, which I'll actually spend maybe 10 minutes just walk through very quickly our evaluation criteria, which is what I talk about actually the other side. So, so that is important that we actually meet those criteria. So at least when they go to Singapore, present to the investor, they actually have reasonably good structure and idea uh, to actually prepare that uh, project. Okay, so perhaps I'll, I'll go into the next. Okay, you even see the slide. This slide is actually Red Dot Venture. Just now it was Lytton University College. So I'm chairman on both sides. Red Dot Venture essentially we are an invest uh, we are like an angel investor and uh, a VC. We invest in many different industries, ICT, IBM, medical technology, so on and so forth. We've been approved by the Singapore government. They would co-invest with us into some company and um, and we have uh, in our portfolio more than 20 tech startup. And our average is that we do one investment every month. So we expect in the next two, three years to have about 50 company in our portfolio. These are generally seed stage startup. What we mean is, is actually a company that uh, sort of have the product development sort already, but they actually need to go to the market. So we call that a customer validation phase. Generally, after the customer validation phase, they will go into market validation. Let's say, for example, you say that I want to validate my idea. Let's say I start up, start up a job portal, and the job portal is mean to support in Yangon uh, uh, job uh, enterprises company who want to hire people through our portal. So, so that is a validation. Maybe the validation is that we want to, them to show that actually maybe 200 companies would hire through the portal. So that is some form of validation. So we normally come in and say that, oh, you have your product ready, uh, you need some money to actually secure this customer in the next couple of years. So what we do is that that's what we call seed stage investment. After you have agreed on that, now you need to go nationwide or you, you say, I want to go to other part of Indochina. 
um, including Laos, Cambodia and all this, starting up a regional type of thing. So maybe then you need more money and then, so, so these are typical development phases. So what we do is typically, when we invest in a company, we, we mentor them. We are like me, Charlie, Julian, we are all entrepreneurs before and we mentor this company, help them, give them the strategy. But we also help them on market traction. Uh, this is an example. One of the reasons why we are bringing them along to Myanmar is not just to share the experience. We also have to give something back to them with you, uh, which is to actually help them to partner, to connect to the right people in Myanmar, understand the Myanmar uh, market so that they can decide whether they want to set up office here or not. So this, to some extent, helping them to expand uh, get market traction. Then the last one, very critical talent. Uh, in fact, a lot of this company, we help them to hire the talent. In Singapore, we also have a similar program, which is, uh, we do many. One year, we do 200 uh, students, similar program. So this 200 is our graduate, and when they graduate, they go to our university company. Like uh, just now, this Pythias, the travel agency, in fact, we have five people that join them. And they are setting up operation in Myanmar. So certainly our student here, I already tell the CEO, we would basically help them to work with ideas so that they can uh, learn and some project. Uh, so, so that is our incubator model. So this is something that actually I'm excited about potentially do in uh, Myanmar. So we can set up an incubation facility that we would have the money, the mentorship, the market traction perhaps then is going to Singapore, helping this company, providing the talent through entrepreneurship environment. So we call that the startup ecosystem. Um, so we can create a small startup ecosystem that help this company to be successful. So our investment criteria are four. Normally I ask four questions. So the first question always is, do you have a differentiated product? Second question is, the differentiated product that you have, obviously it targets a certain niche customer segment. Is that customer segment scalable and profitable? You have that product in the market that you have decided. Do you have the ability to execute on your plan? That's management scalability. Like all investment, no different. We are an investor. Does the risk return profile for this investment appropriate and viable for us? Uh, so, I just quickly go through the detailed question. The key question always been, can product deliver significant yet sustainable differentiation over leading competitors? The starting point always is, let's say you have a job portal. Again, I use that example. We would have one to make sure that whoever that proposed that to us, there's nobody doing it at least in this country. Even somebody is doing it, we know that with our support, we can actually be number one. If we can't be that, chances that we won't invest. Or some product like the 3D printer, for example, immediately we would have said, globally, are there somebody who has that? If globally they don't have that, we won't invest. So that's why the word differentiated product, because the starting point is you need to be different. Unless you are different, you would be lost because you are new, you don't have sufficient uh, capital, you don't have sufficient people, you don't have sufficient track record, how can you compete? So differentiation is important. The second question is that it's not actually difficult to create a differentiated product, but the difficulty then with this differentiated product, the customer segment you target might not be profitable and big enough. Because all businesses need to scale very fast. If you have a differentiated product, you cannot, the business, the market you look at cannot grow by 50% a year. It's not a growth market because we are an investor, as an angel investor, when we put a dollar into the company, we expect 10 to $20 in the next three to five years. We are not the one that come in for 10% interest or dividends return. So growth is very, very key. In order to provide the growth, the market must be big enough. So we look for very big, profitable and growth market. So the problem that the businesses is solving must be for very big market. So from that standpoint, many businesses that we look at, a lot of time we don't invest is because of this. 
I think yesterday you were sharing with me your example. This is an example now. It's a differentiated product. I want to share the detail of the product. But although it's a differentiated product, nobody have it here. But the question is, and you already have recognized that anyway, is the market big enough? If I can't take this, if Myanmar is not big enough, can I take it overseas? If overseas could not use this product, then it's not scalable. So this question always, 8 out of 10 times, when we talk to company, in fact, we talk to Charlie, talk to 20 companies every month, and we only invest in one. And 80% of the time, why we don't invest? The criteria that tend to fail is because the market and the problem is solving is not profitable and large enough. Management scalability, so what do we look out for in management scalability? Because we as an investor, very early stage, the company have no track record, sometimes the, even the entrepreneur have no track record, why do we give them the money? So we also must see that they are committed. What do you mean by committed? Committed means that a lot of the time, they really have the skin in the game. Like they put in their own money, like they actually uh, really work long hours investing in it. So we want to see those things and also of course we want to see that they have the ability at least to execute on the plan in the next two, three years. Sometimes being young doesn't mean that the person we will not invest in. In fact, everybody that you see here, everybody is below 30 years old. Uh, Don, uh, Roger, Roger just came out from university, fresh, and we invested in him. Right? How do we know that he could actually do what he's doing? We don't know. But we feel that he can do it, we feel that he's committed, we invest in him. So, so management scalability, I think, is important. Then investment viability is always about this because every businesses we invest in, a lot of the time is to know the financial runway. If the businesses need, I come back to job portal again. If the businesses need five million before the next investor will come in, if you only have a million, then we shouldn't invest because the runway is not long enough before the next investor come in. So, so therefore, we actually have the access. There are many things such as risk return, uh, basic like I just talked about now. Can we get 10 times return? If we can't, minimum. Then we won't invest because the failure rate is very high. So we have to be ready for failure. But our return is also very high. So that's why we are an angel investor. So these are the questions that we ask. So these are the four major questions. So these are the questions that we get integrated into our program. And, and we would have people, even like myself, will be, when the capstone project, when they come up with the idea, our advice, our, you know, we would actually, because we are practitioner, so we know what the business plan, what is acceptable to the market, we would actually provide those questions so that you actually get real life learning rather than just on the book. Uh, so I'm not going to go through all those uh, companies. So this is just a few slides that uh, we have put together to say that why we invest in all those companies. These companies are the ones who, who came in, uh, that we brought them along, we have invested in them. Viral 3D, Payware, Daylight Studio, and uh, we also have Pythias, we have uh, Fiat, uh, also we have invested in them, we brought them along, although they were not presented. Yeah, so. so any question you might have? Yeah, well, one of my friends running a very small company here, so we're building. So he's chasing the projects and competing with the local companies. So he just rather like to work with uh, the investors from foreign countries and even want to get outsourcing like that. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to know what is your opinion, a little bit perspective about okay. moving forward from your entrepreneurship point of view. Okay. So one of the thing, uh, I have not talked to many people, but in fact for the last two days, although I've been to Myanmar four or five times, but only in this trip that I'm really trying to engage with the industry. That's why we actually had the networking session on Friday to start meeting up with more people. Today, I'm glad I met quite a few people so I get a slightly better insight into what people are doing. Okay, so 
one group of people, which is a majority of the company we meet with, generally they are essentially IT business owner. Uh, they develop software. Uh, they are services company generally, or they distribute hardware product or third party software product. So this business, let's say purely that business, you actually would not be able to get funding from venture capitalists, high tech investors like ourselves. Why? The basis is that if you don't own your intellectual property, you would not actually be able to scale your business. Right? Let's say, i give you an example. Let's say um, I task with uh, distributing um, a particular piece of software in Myanmar. So your maximum market is actually Myanmar. That might not be big enough. But if I have my own software, there's no limit how far I can grow because the world is my market. So I can actually scale my business. So, so without actually owning the intellectual property, the investor would not accept. Okay, generally. But having said, so most of the country, like Singapore, there's no way that a services company would be able to get investor generally. But for services company, the only one that has some chance is actually potentially outsource development. Uh, why? Because it's still a very large population here, base, and the cost is still quite good, quite, quite competitive. Understand what is it, 60 million or 80 million? What's the population? 60, right? Yeah. So the outsourced business, the Indian do very well because they are billion people. The China do reasonably okay. So there are companies like Infosys, you know, all those big companies that are listed company, uh, they build very big business. But for smaller countries like Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, there's no chance actually you can build a, an outsourcing business. Myanmar a little bit on the borderline because the cost here compared to the rest of many countries is still quite low. So therefore, I think to do business, I think it's okay. I think that can be a good way to build up the business. Naturally, a lot of these companies who do custom software projects, which is to me a services company, or outsourcing, they will move toward developing their product at a certain point in time. Sometimes they can move, sometimes they can't. If they get too big, actually not easy to make the move. Because naturally, you're already a services company with many people. You can't go in and develop a product. So there will be this art company, and this art company, I'm sure, has its potential. But for smaller startup, for smaller entrepreneur, it's going to be very difficult trying to go into them. So the smaller company can come up with highly innovative product, highly innovative, disruptive model. Even you are two-man operation with no money. Because you are so different, Nobody compete with you, and you can sometimes beat a bigger company. So therefore, I think the future to me is that this technology entrepreneur has a role to play because there are so many opportunities, and a bigger company, given they are very busy, let's say, running projects, software development, they do, really don't have the time, and they are not, probably not focused enough because they do many, many projects. So the young one, they can do one thing and they do it well, and they can move into the market, and they can build, in fact, company that can be bigger when, the, when they are sold out because the investor tend to put higher value on such type of startup. So we don't see many, but we hear quite a few because I think the market, uh, like we hear, like for example, just now we hear, uh, he left now, is like the Groupon, uh, you know, this Groupon is a deal site that you can get uh, e-commerce, but you get significant discount. It's quite common model in the US, everywhere else around the world. We also see a job site, but they're all very early day. So I think that the opportunity to really create a lot of this different type of internet, mobile type of business, particularly we believe the number of user on mobile and internet is going to rapidly grow. And we are not talking about 10% 5% every year. You're talking about the whole penetration moving from less than 10% to 80% in the next two, three years. It means that the movement will be so fast that everybody could potentially change the way they work. And of course, there are issues to be sorted out, like payment, for example. Unless you have payment, your e commerce business would be very difficult to move up. But I don't know. 
you know, I think you know better. If you talk about six to twelve months, the, in, the adoption is going to increase. Six to twelve months is a very short time. If I were you, I would prepare. Once the market hit that, you are ready, better than anybody else. This business is about speed. You know, when you do this tech venture, because it's about grabbing market share, sometimes it's not about profitability. You have to have enough market to grab your market share. You have a first mover advantage. Then you move in, and you know those tech startup, those very popular uh, personality that we hear, those guys don't sleep, they work 20 hours a day. They really run because they know that if they don't run fast enough, a six month different can basically make a difference whether they make it or they don't. So, so that's why I think for young people, it's really a great opportunity to do this. Even the company do not become successful, they will really learn so much from it because they are forced into a corner, back against the wall, that the, the opportunity to learn and to actually have to achieve would basically get them to, to put in all those hours. I think what we, we try to do is that if we have a structured way preparing them for that battle, preparing them to have the insight, the skills, the network, then they can actually move toward and when they get in, they have a better chance of success. Yeah, I appreciate your, your patience and uh, thanks for coming. Thanks.